Hello everybody, Mike Westfall here with McDonald Garden Center. Hope everybody is doing well. Uh, today we've got a fun topic. Today we're gonna be talking about my top five insider tips to prepare your garden for fall. It's a great time of the year. I love fall, absolutely love it. Coming out of the summertime where it's been so hot, maybe it's dry, we start to get a little bit more rainfall hopefully. Um, it's just a great season, the leaves are changing colors. There's just a lot of different things that you can do in the yard and in the garden. Um, and that's kind of what I wanna talk about is some of my top five insider tips and these change every year really I mean every year I'm kind of thinking of different ones and you know it really kind of coincides with maybe what you didn't get done in spring uh, or maybe something that you want to continue doing so we'll talk about a lot of these as we go through it's a lot of fun um, to get into the fall season and get into the mode of you know spending some time outdoors family, friends, you know, it really inviting people into your home and around your home. It's a great time to consider that and start to think about some of the things that you want to do. So what goes into that? Of course, planning. Planning is always something that I talk about. This is uh, not part of my top five. I've got two little things I want to talk about first and planning is one of them. So planning, of course, you know, is, is uh, the probably the most essential part of being successful when you're gardening um, is to think about what you want to do, make lists, kind of prepare everything. Um, there's so many projects that you might uh, want to consider. Maybe there's some that you need to finish and, um, and, and maybe you just want to focus on specific areas. Maybe you've got a large project. Maybe you want to uh, install a landscape. Maybe you want to pl plant a bunch of trees and shrubs. Um, or maybe you just want to spruce up your front porch. So a couple different things that you want to look at is just kind of you know inspecting your yard, walking around, seeing if there's problem areas. Uh, get a nice list because when you come into the garden center, we can accomplish all of those things in one fell swoop or you can kind of plan it out throughout the fall season so that you're hitting those moments specifically correct. And that's kind of what I wanna talk about today as well is, is making sure that we're getting some of those key things that we wanna get done accomplished at the right time because fall is, is kind of weird in this area. Hampton Roads especially, and of course across the country, you know, everybody's got different weather patterns. Um, but here in Hampton Roads, you know, September can be a warmer month than, than what you kind of think. We feel like it's fall, we wanna get into the fall mode, but sometimes it might be too early to do certain things, sometimes it's too late to do certain things. So we'll kind of address that a little bit as well as we go through this. Um, but think about what you wanna do, make a list. Um, there's lots of lots of subjects. I mean, you can look at your lawn, you can uh, transplant shrubs, you can divide perennials, um, you can bring your indoor, your, your indoor plants that maybe you put on your front porch for a summer vacation, you can bring those inside. It's start time to start thinking about that. Um, so there's lots and lots of things that you can uh, kind of, uh, of consider this time of the year, but make a list do a little bit of pl planning, get your questions ready, come in and see us here at the garden center and ask the experts and we'll get you all the answers you need. The next thing I wanna talk about is don't prune. This might sound weird, right? Uh, a lot of people I think, and I see it a lot, um, a lot of people are out there pruning right now or, or, or pruning um, as we kind of go into the season. Uh, into the fall season and, and people are thinking I've got these big pruning projects I really got a lot that I want to accomplish well to do major pruning it's really not the best time we'll send you a link um, over in the comments section that'll take you to a great little uh, spreadsheet that is done by the Virginia Cooperative Extension um, and it really lists a lot of shrubs that we grow in this area um, and if you look, you'll see that August, September, and October are completely blanked out. There's not many plants that you really can prune that time of year. And really what I'm talking about is big prunes. So, you know, big heavy prunes where we're, we're taking the shrub back maybe by a third um, or we're doing some major limb pruning on, on a tree. You can do small stuff. So I'm not saying that you can't, if you wanna do kind of what this picture is showing here, just doing a little bit of touch up pruning, you know, tidying up your shrubs, make them a little tighter and neater, that's fine. But here's the reason I don't want you to go and do some major pruning. And that is one, if there's summer blooming shrubs or even spring blooming shrubs, then they're already setting buds or that growth that you're cutting off is what they would bloom on next year. A great example are azaleas and camellias. Azaleas and camellias, we grow a ton of them in this area. I'm sure you probably have some in your yard. And so azaleas and camellias have already set their buds for next year. Um, now, if they're fall blooming camellias, they're already set their buds for this fall. So you don't wanna prune your azaleas and camellias because it'll really hamper the amount of blooms that it'll do next year. Hydrangeas, tricky subject. Hydrangeas, I mean, I've done an entire webinar on hydrangeas on when to prune them because there's so many different kind of classifications in hydrangeas, but the best thing is to probably not prune them and live with the size of the shrub and we'll attack it next year at the right time. So there's a huge list. I can't go through all of it now, but if you're doing a little bit of light touch up work, that's fine. However, here's my favorite tip. 
I would recommend that you wait to do some of that tip pruning to kind of clean up your shrubs, especially if they're boxwoods, hollies, conifers, because those make great cut greens for the Christmas time. Whether you're bringing them inside, making wreaths and garlands, making you know any kind of arrangement that you might be using, front porch, porch pots, I love those. Um, we're gonna be showing you demonstrations of those all the way through the Christmas season. So don't go prune off all your greens yet because you'll want them when you, when, you know, that, that kind of end of November, December time frame. And that's actually a pretty good time to prune. You'll start to see on that list um, that, that, uh, that there's, some t there, there's some November, December, January prune time frames that you can kind of do some of those shrubs. And so a little bit of pruning here and there is fine. A little limb up maybe here and there, a little tidying up on some things. If you're correcting problems, that's completely fine. But Generally speaking, if you're gonna go and do some major, major pruning, it's better to wait. And here's kind of the scientific reason why, is because pruning really stimulates growth. And so really when we're pruning a shrub, most of the time we're pruning it to fill it out, make sure that it gets nice and full and compact. Um, and this is kind of shrub and tree kind of specific, but we're kind of pruning for that reason. And so when you prune something, it stimulates growth, and therefore what can happen is we can get a nice flush of growth but then all of a sudden, it's around the middle, beginning of November time frame, and then we get a frost, and all that new growth that hasn't had a chance to harden off can get burned off. Plus, if we're pruning things that are deciduous, um, like hydrangeas um, or trees that drop their leaves, so deciduous plants will drop their leaves. You know, think of some of your summer blooming plants like roses um, or, or uh, clethra or, or summer sweet, or a, there's a, a whole list of plants that will drop their leaves, obviously, in the winter. And so what they're doing is they're going into their dormancy. And by pruning them, you're stimulating growth, and they're kind of, kind of curious as to what is happening. Now, if you just did it, you're fine. You're okay, you're gonna have plenty of time. In fact, probably till about the middle of September, you're okay, but I'm kind of pre-warning you that uh, don't prune in that August, September, October timeframe, especially if we're doing heavy pruning. It's always better to wait. Uh, wait till your plants go dormant. If they go dormant, if they're deciduous, and if they're evergreen, might as well save them and use them for your cut greens, for your holiday decorating. Your plants will love you for it, and you'll be happy because you won't have lost all those fresh greens. Uh, Teresa, hello. So she said, with the temperatures getting ready to fall, what are ways to prepare house plants that have been outside for much of the summer with respect to pest? Great question. And I didn't put that on my top five list. So great question, because I can touch on that real quick. It is time to start preparing. Typically what I say is once temperatures get below 50, you might even say 60 degrees at night consistently. So we don't know when that's gonna be, right? Mother nature you know, can fool us a couple times here and there. But as you're preparing your plants to bring them back indoors, then it's a good time to inspect your plants. And that basically means just go out, check them out, kind of look around, uh, make sure your plants don't have any kind of uh, fungal looks on the leaves, meaning some black spots, brown spots, things like that, yellowing leaves, things that, that don't look normal, and also inspect for insects. Now, generally speaking, what I would say is treat them as a preventative rather than curative. So lots and lots of solutions out there. You can be, be, be completely organic with a, a spinosad soap or a neem oil. Um, we have triple action, which is one of my favorites. You can do uh, drenches in your soil to kill eggs and things like that. So we've got you covered on any of those things that you might need, um, but it's always better to be preventative rather than curative. And that's that's a great question, Teresa. Definitely inspect your plants. Do a little, uh, a little bit of preventative maintenance by kind of touching them up, cleaning them up, doing a little bit of pruning, cleaning out some leaves, getting some of that dead debris out of there. Um, I would not repot them. That is one really, really good tip is a lot of people repot them before they bring them inside. Typically, houseplants like to be root bound. They don't want a lot of soil around them going into a season where they're not gonna grow as much indoors. So if you take your plants outside, you usually take them out to kind of burst some growth, and then you bring them back inside to enjoy them during the you know, fall, winter, and, uh, and early spring time frame before you take them back out again. Um, and so if you're doing that, don't repot them. Typically, indoor plants have a harder time drying out. So if you go and you put you know, a small plant into a big pot, then all of a sudden you've got all this soil around that root ball that can hold a lot of moisture. So great question, Teresa. It's not on my top five list, but it should have been maybe. Um, it's a great one, and uh, maybe we'll do a complete webinar on just how to uh, bring in your plants and prepare them for the, the, the winter season inside your home. So, okay, I'm gonna get started on my top five list, and this is just me. You know, yours could be different. Um, these are just some of the things that um, I always think of. Hey, Deborah. 
Um, and so number five is going to be porch pots and container gardens. So one of my favorite subjects of all time is planting up containers. And a lot of times you kind of get where it's like, all of a sudden you come into the garden center and you're like, I know I need some mums, I need some pansies, I need some you know ornamental peppers, I need some really pretty things I wanna put in my pots, but maybe you didn't think through it all the way and you get home and you're kinda of like, well, this looks good, should I rip this out, should I put this in? Um, so take a little bit of time, like I mentioned, and do a little bit of planning and prepare. And so go into your porch pots, look at them, see if there's any elements that you can keep. You know, a lot of times we'll use like a green spike in the center of our plant, as you can see up there. Um, so a green spike or even the maroon spikes do really, really well. And those are all in that kind of Dracaena family. Um, and even like Dusty Miller, you know, Dusty Miller will make it all the way through the winter. Maybe you have some snapdragons that have been kind of just sitting there doing nothing, um, but they will revive. And so it's a hard thing because some of your summer annuals might be looking fabulous. You know, you might have begonias that are huge. You might have some different things that, that look so good that you don't really want to pull them out. But it's not a bad idea to kind of say, hey, these are gonna get worse over time and I need to get my, my fall annuals in or my fall color in so that I've got a show to put on. Mums are a great option. You can see those mums over in those containers. I've got this gorgeous purple one behind me. Mums are really, really great in containers and they're easy to kind of fill in, a lot of color. I love mums just singly by themselves in a pot. Um, terracotta, I use that picture because I absolutely love terracotta pots. Terracotta is so easy um, that, uh, and it just kind of gives you that fall feel. And so I really like terracotta. And so thinking about maybe adding some containers to your collection um, or looking at your containers that you already have. Uh, you know, it's a great time to consider how you can age your terracotta. Uh, I like to sometimes, uh, you know, take them in the, you know, winter time frame and stick them in a shady area, in a moist area that gets a lot of shade and just let the moss naturally grow on them. You can whitewash them, you can do a lot of different things to them. So terracotta is one of my favorites and they just work great year round, but especially in the fall. There's nothing better than a croton like this one back here. So let me show you a couple things here. Uh, this is a croton. I absolutely love crotons. They are amazing. They remind me of the tropical season that we're kind of still in, you know, in the summer. But as you approach fall, it's a great one because it has all those fall colors in there. It's got the maroons and the oranges and the reds and the yellow and the green. It's just a great plant. Croton is amazing and there's lots of different styles of crotons as well. And these are great indoor plants, but you can also take them outside and leave them on the porch until temperatures get below 50. Um, so, uh, so uh, Alice said, when do pansies come out uh, to plant a pot? So pansies, great question, Alice. Um, and that was one thing I was gonna talk about. You probably don't see any pansies here and that's because we don't have them yet. You might find them out there, um, but we really don't recommend planting pansies until October. Now, not saying that we won't have some in September. It'll probably be, probably the earliest we typically get them is about mid to end of September. That's about the earliest we'll get them. Um, but pansies really do best as we know that the temperatures aren't gonna rise again. And like I mentioned, September can be a warmer month. So as we get into October, we always like to use the alphabet to kind of describe this. O comes before P. October before you plant your pansies. So wait for October and then plant your pansies would be my recommendation. But if you wanna get them a little bit early, you can. Um, and we typically will have a, a, a small sample of some pansies as we approach the mid to end period of September. But pansies are a great option. Right now, mums are in, mums are full. They look great. They're tightly budded, which is what you want. Uh, you know, it's hard pressed to find one that really was, was, was opening up some. Um, and that's what you want is, you want those tightly budded mums so that they bloom the entire time frame at your house. Um, and so mums are great ones. I love these ornamental peppers. They are absolutely amazing. These will go all the way into November. They're really, really easy to grow. Here's another little sample. You can get them in yellows and oranges and reds and purples. They are absolutely amazing in containers. I've got a couple porch pots here that I really like. So if you're interested in doing a porch pot and maybe you just don't wanna do it and you just wanna grab it and go and just pop it on your porch, we've got a bunch of these that are made up and they are absolutely stunning. So this has this really cool spurge in it, um, and then it's got some uh, ajuga and some ivy. Uh, really, really nice kind of heuchera look. It's really, really cool. So euphorbia, sorry, I said spurge. It's a euphorbia in the middle. Um, so great containers. We've got a bunch of combinations that really, really look good. 
Um, and we can help you make some too. So take some pictures of the containers you have. Maybe there's some elements in there. Maybe there's some grasses. Maybe there's some different things in there that uh, you can continue to use and you don't have to discard them. You don't have to start all the way over again. And then you can pop in some other color um, and really make a show. Or we can refresh it. Maybe you've had this container and you've been planting in it and it's kind of not doing as well as it used to. It might not be a bad idea to, to take everything out dump the soil out, put it in the compost pile, get a fresh bag of potting soil. It's a great idea to kind of refresh your containers. So think about your fall containers because the season is approaching and it's a great time to plant all of those things up. My number four is mulch. Mulch is so important. I, I just can't express to you how many benefits there are of mulching your landscape. So if you didn't do it in the spring, you definitely should do it in the fall. And the reason why you should mulch in the fall is because it helps protect the root system of your plants. You've invested lots of money and time watering, fertilizing, pruning, doing different things into your shrubs and your plants and your annuals and your perennials and everything that you got in your yard. Invest in the mulch. Trust me, it'll help you immensely. It'll save a ton of time with the weeding, but also it protects the root system. It keeps the temperature regulated. I can't, I can't stress how important that is that uh, plants don't go through the stresses of what we are experiencing above the ground. Soil temperature stays pretty consistent, but when we get these really high 90, 95 days, and then they drop down to a week of, you know, in the 70s, and then they jump back up, that ray, that kind of, you know, bouncing back and forth in temperature, especially if it's occurring in the soil, is not great for plants. They really want a regulated temperature. They want it to slowly decline and slowly increase, and that's what mulch does. It also keeps moisture in. It makes watering so much easier. When we're going through dry periods, there's nothing worse than going out and watering a plant and just seeing all the water running away. Mulch will help keep that soil um, you know, activated and keep that soil allowing moisture to go in and, and percolate down into the root system. Mulch decomposes over time. There's just so many benefits and I think the number one benefit of mulching is of course the look. I mean it just looks finished, it looks completed, it looks amazing. You know when you freshly lay down a mulch it is one of the best things that you can do and there's lots of choices out there. Of course you've got your regular hardwoods. I like the dyed mulches because they don't cut, they don't lose their color as, as quickly. Uh, make sure you're getting good quality dyed mulch. Uh, pine straw is a really really fantastic mulch. It's completely natural. Cypress, cedar, the list goes on and on. There's a ton to choose from so if you've got questions about your mulch when you come in let us know we can answer any of those questions for you uh, but mulching has so many benefits beyond just the look but that's one of my favorites is the fact that it just makes your landscape stand out and there's no better time to do it than in the fall so as we approach the fall season start thinking about mulching your your landscape and your plants um, even some containers i'll always sprinkle a little bit of mulch around the top of my container just to keep it nice and fresh looking uh, Let's see, Trina said, for porch pots, how often should the soil be a minute? That's a great question. Um, and it really depends. Um, it depends on the look of the soil. It depends on how the plants are performing. I typically change mine out every year. So I'll, use, I'll freshen it up in the spring, and then I'll use it again in the fall, and then I dump it out, put it in the compost pile, and buy a new batch in the spring. That's me. I've seen people get probably, you know, uh, you know, 18 months, maybe 24 months, two years, uh, but you're starting to push it as far as that soil really starts to lose a lot of its potential to hold nutrients in, hold moisture in, and so eventually you need to just put it in the compost pile and get some fresh new uh, potting soil. Plus, insects and different things can get in there, diseases, they start to brew, and while it might not affect your ornamental pepper or your mum, then the next thing that you plant, it could. So definitely recommend uh, you know changing out. Personally, every 12 months is what I do. Get on a schedule, and it kind of keeps you kind of remembering, okay, it's spring, time to buy new potting soil. Um, Deborah said, how do you feel about rubber mulch? Rubber mulch is a tricky one. Um, you know, it's recycled, it's, it, so it's, it, the, per, the purpose of using it is, is that it, it recycles, uh, you know, probably usually old tires is typically what they use. Um, it's softer on the feet. The problem with that I have with rubber mulch is it floats. And so when you get heavy downpours, which we get in the Hampton Roads area, and even Deborah, you up in Richmond, um, you know, we'll get those heavy downpours and that mulch will move. Whereas lots of other mulches kind of thatch themselves, kind of you know form this kind of nice little knit between each other where it'll kind of hold a little bit. Rubber mulch won't. Now the nice thing about rubber mulch is it lasts a very long time. Um, the downfall of it is it can move on you. So if you're working on slopes or slants or different things like that, I probably wouldn't recommend it. 
if you're working in an area that's nice and flat and you don't get a lot of kind of flooding in that area, even when we have those crazy, you know, one inch downpours that all of a sudden happen, then rubber mulch could work. So don't have a major problem. It really doesn't affect the soil as much. So it's not like leaching anything typically into the soil. I probably wouldn't use it around my edible plants just in case because you don't know where that rubber necessarily came from. Um, and, uh, and, and you're always gonna be better off with the organic or the hardwood mulches or anything that's kind of naturally made uh, because it'll biodegrade. Downfall, you gotta keep buying it, but the good news is you're actually amending your soil over time. So you're actually making your soil better because those bark matter or that pine straw matter is breaking down and adding organic matter to your soil. So great question. Um, I don't really sell rubber mulch, but I'm not saying that it's the worst thing in the world either. Just be careful about where you use it. Um, all right, my number three is think about your garden decor. You know, this is something that I think a lot of people forget is, is you know, we've got, you know, our flag out there that's got, you know, mine right now has stars and stripes and flip flops on it. Um, and, and so it's, you know, is it still summertime or am I starting to want, really want to start to, you know, really kind of encourage the fall mood. And so you want to start looking at your, your garden decor and start kind of taking some of those maybe spring summery elements out of your uh, landscape and in your decor around your front porch. And you start want to swapping over to some fall decor, you know, maybe some nice new welcome signs, a new flag. I always say a new little garden flag or a new standard size flag really helps kind of set the tone of what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, think about wheat straw, bales of wheat straw, corn stalks, all the different pumpkins. There's so many different things that you can choose from as far as a pumpkin goes, a squash, a gourd. There's so many different choices there. So think about all those elements that you can do to add to your landscape, add to your front porch, add to your decor. And of course, don't forget about your indoor spaces. You know, think about some of the natural elements that you can bring in as the leaves change color, as they fall. Pick up some orange and some yellow and some red leaves and use them for a, a tablescape. Add light. I can't can't tell you how important I think light is. You know, candles and these Invisalights that you can see here, they're great to kind of pull out of your Christmas decorating package a little early and kind of start to use them around your home. And use light outside. Think about solar lights. Solar lights really add a ton to your landscape. We've got some great decorative designs here, um, but you can get them really kind of anywhere. But solar powered lights are amazing. They've come a long way um, and they're really fun and they add some ambiance to your yard and to your garden because the days are gonna get shorter. So it's gonna start becoming nighttime a little bit earlier, but you still want the day to go on and those nighttime temperatures when they are sitting right in that 60, 65 range, you can't beat it and you wanna be outside. So think about adding light to your outdoor spaces. Edison bulbs. Fire pits, I love a nice fire pit. Sit out back, um, enjoy you know, a couple drinks with family and friends um, and enjoy this nice cool fall season. So add light to your garden, add some fall decor. Uh, there's so many different choices that you can choose from. We've got chimeneas, we've got you know, these nice big pumpkin faces. Um, so you can turn them, you know, turn them around and have the back you know, exposed for just a pumpkin look and then you can turn it around and have a jack-o'-lantern look for, for Christmas or for Halloween. So it's a lot of fun. There's lots and lots of choices. Um, you know, think about all of those things included indoors, but also spruce up your front porch. We've got great ideas for mums, wheat straw, corn stalks, pumpkins. You can add so many different types of things, harvest corn. There's so many different things that you can do to add to your decor outside. So don't forget about all of those um, as we go into the, uh, to the fall season. So think about your front porch. It's always a good project. The next one is coal crops. One of my favorite things. So coal crops are spelled just how I spelled it up there, C-O-L-E. Uh, a lot of people call them cold crops because cold crops are kind of what we think of, you know, as they grow through this cooler, colder season. And that's why I absolutely love cold crops. Cold crops, there's a huge group of them for one. And two, they're so easy and they're so vitamin rich too. They're packed with vitamins and they're easy to grow. And so if you've never grown a vegetable garden, I encourage you if you're ever, I always tell people when they're starting out vegetable gardening, if they've never done it before, to try cold crops first because you're gonna be successful. I can almost guarantee it. They're very, very easy. They don't require specific you know, types of fertilizer. You know, a little bit of you know, organic garden tone from a spoma would work perfectly. Um, the McDonald Green, the McDonald Greenleaf, the organic or the traditional is great. You know, you kind of want to watch your timing a little bit. You might have to fought, fight some of those cabbage moths out there, uh, a little bit of aphids, things like that. They're super easy to take care of though. Um, and they're just easy to grow. And so what we're talking about here is spinach, lettuce, collards, kale, Swiss chard, beets, 
turnips, carrots. Uh, the spinach is one of my favorites. It's so easy. The list goes on and on. There's a ton and ton of choices that you can go and check out. And I've got some great examples here. Um, so I'll show you here the cabbages and the kales. Look at this. I just went and pulled a tray. I just went and pulled one from everything that we've got. Look at that. I mean, and these are so easy. So what you're going to typically do, you can do this from seed or you can do it from, um, so you can do it from seed or you can do it from these packs. So these are little four packs. So there's a little four pl pack of plants. You can see it's got four little plants down there. And you just pull these out and plant them. And what I love about a majority of these, some of the cabbages you gotta let head up. Uh, you can take some of the younger leaves off and eat them. But what I li love about some of these lettuces, like one of my favorites is this red sails. Let me get this one over here. Yeah, this is red sails. It is one of the best lettuces. It's so easy to grow and it just produces. And what you do is as it grows and gets bigger, you just take off some of these lower leaves, add them to your salad, and they're super, super tasty. You won't have tasted lettuce until you've grown your own lettuce. Really easy to grow. Uh, things that need to head up take a little bit more time, a little bit more patience, like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts can take a long time. In fact, if you probably haven't started Brussels sprouts, it's probably not gonna happen this season. You might get a shot in the spring. That's the other cool thing about all of these is a majority of them are gonna produce all the way through the winter. Even in the coldest months, they might not do much, but they're not gonna die. And that's where I love spinach. Let's see, did I grab a spinach? I think so, yeah. So here's spinach. Spinach is super, super healthy for you. It's really, really tasty. It's easy to grow. Um, and they're really, really uh, just one of the simplest things to do. And one of my favorite stories is um, what the, uh, the original owner of McDonald Garden Center, Eddie Anderson, told me one time, is this is what the settlers lived on. So Jamestown, obviously the settlers landed in Jamestown, very near to our homes here in the Hampton Roads area. So we know they dealt with the same issues that we deal with. Um, but this was their most successful crop, was the turnips and the beets and the lettuces and the carrots and all of those different things. It was one of the ways they kind of really survived the, the, the first couple winters was by growing these. And so because of that, knowing that they were so successful back when, when they landed here, then we can also kind of learn from that and say this is a very successful, easy crop to grow. Coal crops, one of my all-time favorites. If you haven't done vegetable gardening before, try coal crops. They're so easy to grow and you can grow them anywhere. So you can do them in containers. You can do them in uh, your landscape. You can just add them to your landscape. They look great in the landscape. They're very, very easy to grow. Um, and you can do them in containers, raised beds, in your landscape, in rows. You can go to town. You can do some simple, small little samples of them. You know, throw in some herbs. Herbs are starting to kind of revive as we get cooler. So you can get another little shot at parsley, um, even uh, cilantro and different things like that, dill, fennel, all of those fun herbs. So, you know, go back in the, in the garden and kind of, you know, if, if your tomatoes are kind of looking like they're kind of done, um, your peppers are kind of fizzling out. It's a great time to kind of consider popping in some of these guys uh, because they will produce and they're super, super easy. And I and trust me, you'll be successful. And there's a, a whole kind of, you know, you know, you can do a whole lot of different things with them to be very, very successful. But trust me, they're pretty easy. You pop them in the ground, keep them watered uh, and keep trimming them. It's kind of like the herb thing that I always say, which is use them or lose them with with uh, with with lettuces and, and collards and kale use them or lose them. You want to continue to eat those leaves and keep them producing new ones. Um, and that'll keep you going all the way through the winter into the spring season. So it's a great crop to try. If you've never tried it, trust me, you will love it. Try it. And my number one uh, thing to consider for the fall season is, of course, your lawn. Uh, lawns are very, very uh, important to us. They're impactful to us. If you've got kids, uh, you know, maybe as you get older, you're narrowing your size of your lawn. You're maybe making it smaller, making your landscape bigger. Um, but a little green space really puts us at peace. Um, and it's a great thing to do, whether you're growing a natural lawn or a desirable lawn. It doesn't really matter. There are things that you can do in the fall season. Um, and so let's talk about your summer grasses first. Uh, so summer grasses are like your St. Augustine, Bermuda, Zoysia, those types of, uh, of grasses. Those are the three that we typically grow in this area. And there's still things that you can do. You know, you, you want to start looking at your weeds, make sure that those fall weeds don't come in. There's a big crop of fall weeds like chickweed and henbit, all those same things that you had in the spring can come back in the fall. So you want to get down a pre-emergent if that's something that you want to do. You can still get in another feed. So you can still do like a St. Augustine weed and feed if you're growing St. Augustine. It's not a bad time to do that. You can also put down your winter uh, survival or your winter your winterizer type of fertilizer. That's a great one to do in the, uh, in the fall season and as we enter the winter 
season. What that is is it's loaded with potassium and protects the root system of that grass throughout the winter season. But you also might be considering overseeding your lawn. So if you're considering like, you know, if you've got St. Augustine or Zoysia, and really typically Zoysia we don't recommend, but let's say St. Augustine and Bermuda, you might consider putting down a ryegrass, which is gonna look pretty similar to what this guy's mowing over here. And that is a very tall, very nice grass um, that you can overseed with. We sell only annual rye because it won't come back next year, which is kind of what you want because perennial rye, you get a patch over here, patch over there, you get some of your landscape bed. But annual rye dies in the summer and allows your grass to come back to life. And so that way you can have an evergreen lawn even though you're growing a summer lawn that's only green for about seven, eight months out of the year, you can still get an evergreen lawn uh, with uh, that overseeding. Um, so let's see, I got a couple questions here. So I'm gonna come back to a couple of those um, and then I'll answer uh, to, uh, Trina, which said, uh, when should grass be uh, aerated? So aeration is a, is a great thing to loosen up the soil. Um, and we've done, so, so you all know, I've done entire webinars on the entire lawn program, especially for your fall lawn grass seed, which would be fescue. Um, so you can go check those out on any of our, uh, on our YouTube page and check out my past webinars on lawn care. I won't get into specific, specific details today, but aeration is a great one. Aeration loosens up your soil. Make sure you're doing a core aerator. So core aerators are the ones that actually pull the plug out of the, out of the ground rather than spike aeration. Spike aeration literally compacts the soil more. So it's a spike, it just pushes the soil apart. It allows nutrients and water to get down to the, the root system a little bit better, but that is all it's really doing is compacting it more. So core aeration, pulls a little sod plug out or a little dirt plug out and it lays it on the top surface and that biodegrades back into the soil and then it allows the other soil to loosen as it fills in those holes. So aeration is a great one. I don't recommend it a ton, really. Um, there are ways to do natural aeration, which I really love, which is adding compost. So adding a thin layer of compost, about a quarter of an inch to a half an inch on your existing lawn is a great way to naturally dethatch. It'll break down some of those grass clippings as long as it's not too, too thick. It'll actually naturally aerate because as it decomposes and works its way into the soil, it'll naturally loosen that soil. And there's nothing better than organic matter in your soil. So Trina, if you haven't aerated already, um, you can do it any time, really. I usually do it right before I seed so I'm not tearing up my seeded area. Um, but um, if you have done it in the past year or so, then I would probably maybe consider a compost treatment. Compost is amazing. It does so many things. It's a world of benefits um, and, and, and probably does more than just aeration. Aeration, one, one accomplished goal. It opens up your soil, allows it to loosen up, whereas compost, putting down a thin layer of compost is going to enrich the soil, add organic matter. It's gonna stimulate my soil microbes. Um, it's gonna allow more water holding capacity. It's gonna naturally aerate. It's gonna naturally dethatch. So you get all of those things just by putting down a thin layer of compost. Now, depends on the size of your yard, if you've got the ability to do it, uh, but it is a great one if you can do that. Um, so let's talk about fescue real quick and then I'll come back and answer all of your questions here at the end. Um, but the, uh, the, the fescue lawn season is, a, is, a, is an important one, um, especially if you're growing a fescue lawn, it's one of the prettiest grasses. And now is the time to start considering what you wanna do. Are you starting from scratch? Are you gonna kill everything and start all over again? I know it sounds aggressive, but I usually say if your lawn is 50% weeds or more, then you should start from scratch. Come in and see us, we can help you through the process. We have a very, very simplified. Um, and if you're just doing an overseed and we've got great kits, it's super, super easy to kind of, to kind of accomplish. We do two kits for our lawn program, for our fall, uh, for our fescue lawn program, one in the fall and one in the spring. It's all about the grass seed in the fall. So right now it's all about growing the grass seed, getting the grass to, to, to kind of thicken up, fill in, fill in add a lot of nutrients, and then in the spring, then we're gonna attack the weeds. So spring and summer is all about attacking weeds, no fertilizer, nothing like that. It's all about controlling the weeds so that the lawn is healthy. And then in the fall, we're gonna go back and we're gonna fill in it with grass seed, overseed a little bit, and, and start adding some nutrients. So again, I won't go into too many details other than to say, to come and check us out if you've got any questions. We carry one of the best grass seeds in the area. This is our blend, it's specific to our store, to our company, to McDonald Garden Center. You can't get this anywhere else. People rave about it, it is absolutely amazing. Always, always look at the back label on your grass seed. This is pure seed. We don't add any kind of fillers, we don't do anything like that. Uh, so this is pure seed, it's got an 85% germination rate. It has almost literally no weed content. Uh, it's 0.5 of other crop seed and 1.91% of inert matter, which is dust, and then it's 0.09% weed seed. So 
pure fescue seed. I mean, almost 100% pure and there's no coatings on it. It's just great seed. And so always make sure that you're getting the best seed when you, uh, when you buy a fescue grass seed, that you're getting what you're paying for. This is a five pound bag, uh, I believe, or is it 10 pounds? I can't remember now. It's five pounds. So we got five pound bag, we got a 10 pound bag and a 20 pound bag, and you're getting actually five pounds of grass seed. If you look at other labels, you'll see in a 10 pound bag, you're actually probably getting five pounds, maybe even two pounds of grass seed because of all the coatings and fillers that they put in there. So check out the label. It's a super important thing. Uh, come to the experts. We've been doing lawns for 75 years. So if you live in the Hampton Roads area, you consider doing a fescue lawn, you gotta come in and see us. Uh, we do uh, in-person seminars. You can always go to our website at mcdonaldgardencenter.com to check out if we are having any of those in-person seminars. Think about other things that involve your lawn. Moles and voles. Maybe you got some mole and vole issues that you need to attack. We can help you with those. Uh, maybe you've got you know some of those summer grasses that I mentioned and you're not quite sure what to do in the fall season. We can help you with those as well. So fall, great time to think about your lawn. And that's really kind of everything that I got for you. So I'm gonna go back before I finish up and I will answer some of these questions. So let me go back because I know I missed a couple. Um, can you uh, disinfect and reuse soil that had pests in them? I found mealybugs in my outside garden pots. If you still think the soil is good, um, if you still feel like it's a viable soil, it looks good, it looks healthy, uh, yes, we can treat it. So we can treat it with uh, you know, any kind of insecticide, whether it's organic or natural um, and, or, or uh, you know, traditional. So you might take your potting soil, take out the plants, remove the plants, um, and then take that soil and we can treat it with you know, lots of different things. I would probably come in and talk to the garden expert before, uh, and for specifically for mealybugs, but to kill eggs, we can do that. There's not a whole lot of products that will do it, but there are some that you can do. You can also bake it, so you can take it and you can put it like in a, in a black uh, trash bag or something and put it out in the full sun, especially when we get really, really hot, and it'll bake it and kind of kill off any of those eggs. There's a couple different things that you can do. I personally would recommend, if you're not quite sure, add it to the compost pile. Compost piles will heat up and so they'll really get warm and that really kills off a lot of the eggs and a lot of the uh, active living insects because composting is heating up naturally. So throw it in with some leaf litter, throw it in with some you know, kitchen scraps, you know, your, your carrots and your lettuce and different things that you've left over from your salad or when you've been cooking. Uh, don't add meat to it, add some brown stuff to it. You can always add a little bit of newspaper, cardboard, coffee grounds, things like that. Eggshells, great one. So there's a lot of things that you can add to a compost pile and what'll happen is as that decomposes, it'll heat up and cook off any of those things so then you can use it in your landscape to plant up. But I would typically say if you're not quite sure, probably better just to get new potting soil. I think you'll be better off. Um, let's see. Alice said, what about planting bulbs? Did I miss you talking about it? So I didn't talk about planting bulbs, thank you. Um, it's a great time to plant bulbs. Um, typically in the garden centers, in your local garden centers, you're gonna get bulbs probably coming in around and you know, beginning to end, uh, beginning to middle of September. So they should be in very soon. Um, so if you're watching this currently, uh, if you're watching this in the future, typically most garden centers are gonna get their bulbs in the, in the, in the you know, mid September time frame. That's a great time to start considering that. It's a great thing. It's not on my top five list, uh, not this time, but, uh, but it has been in the past. It is a great, great option. Uh, tulips and daffodils and, and uh, all the different ones, you know, muscari and there's just a huge list. And, you know, another little shot at some fall vegetables with the garlic and the onions. So, uh, so it's a great choice to consider some bulbs and planting them in the bottom of your containers so that you get the show in the spring. You can plant them underneath your pansies and they'll pop up through the pansies and it's great. So daffodils and uh, ranunculus and then we'll even get into the amaryllis and different things like that. And we've got a great supply uh, of different things that are coming in throughout the season. So definitely check those out. Definitely a good thing to consider as you go into the fall season is planting those things because, Alice, you bring up a great point, because when, when you see those daffodils and those tulips blooming in the spring season, you missed it. So you gotta think about it now, even though they're gonna sit dormant all the way through that winter season, that is naturally how they work. They need to go through that cooling period. So it's a great, great point, great one, Alice. I, it wasn't on my top five list, maybe it should have been, uh, but planting bulbs is a great thing to consider doing this fall season and start preparing for. Uh, let's see, I got the aeration question, and then, uh, let's see. 
are you saying the cold crops will be fine during the winter season? So it depends on what the winter's like, Deborah. Um, if, if, if we get really, really cold, really, really harsh winter, which we don't typically get, then sometimes the cold crops don't do really well. Uh, and a lot of times through our winters, they'll just sit there and not really grow much. But that means they're still viable when the spring starts to warm up and we start to get a little bit warmer come towards the you know, what, middle end of February as we approach into March you'll start to see your spinach and your lettuce start to revive and grow again. So typically our winters won't kill them off, but not going to be super, super productive. I'll say that. And it depends on the winter. I mean, it depends on, you know, hey, if we get, you know, some really, really heavy snows, let's say we get a foot of snow, it might kill them. Um, if we get really, really wet time frame and then we get a really cold time frame after where the ground can freeze very hard, um, that could also damage them. But just enjoy them in the fall season, see what they do through the winter. I wouldn't dig them up. I would leave them and see if they start to produce again in the spring because most times they will, especially in the Hampton Roads area where our temperatures don't get too cold in the winter. But great question. Uh, I can see we posted the, the list of shrubs there so you, or the, the pruning list, so you can click on that. It's a great little one. I think it's really cool to look at it because it shows you just those three months right there. Don't go out and prune a ton. Uh, do some light trimming if you want to, but save that light trimming for the Christmas time frame because we'll be needing some of those fresh cut greens. We'll be needing the boxwood and the nandina and the holly and the conifers to use for our decorating for the for the Christmas season. So don't go, don't go crazy. Don't prune too heavy. Save it. Look at that list. It'll tell you when to prune. Most of the times it's in the spring, or sometimes you maybe missed it, which is okay too. Just let those shrubs grow and uh, we'll, we'll attack it next year. So uh, I know a lot of people put it on their list. I need to go prune all my stuff in my yard. And you might not want to. So check out that list. That'll help you. Thank you for posting that. And, um, and I think I got everybody's questions. So um, oh, I see one that says I can barely hear you. I hope you. I hope we got that figured out. I hope you were able to hear me, uh, Mary. Uh, but I hope everybody has a great day. This was something that we thought would be fun to kind of get us started for the fall season, uh, get us rolling again. And, um, and so I hope this inspires you to kind of think about all the different projects that you can accomplish this fall season. There's a ton of them. The, we the weather's going to cool off. Enjoy it. Come and see us here at McDonald Garden Center. We hope to see you. Uh, it's a great time to come in and check us out. The store is just jamming with fall color. Pansies soon. Mums now. Grasses are looking amazing. We've got some great looking looking grasses, some great looking combos, uh, and the fall color is just really starting to come uh, in, into, into show here during the fall season. So start to think about what you want to do and come and check us out. And if you've got any questions, let us know. We hope to see you soon. Have a great day, everybody.